Welcome back everybody. So today we got another quick video. I want to touch base and talk about grants and grant writing and what kind of grants are out there, what they all mean, and kind of what stage in your career you should be looking for these. So as always, if you like this kind of video, give it a thumbs up so I know that it's something you're interested in and you want to hear more about. If you have any questions related to this, drop them in the comments. Or if you have other videos that you want to hear me talk about, make sure to drop them down below and I'll try to make a video about them. So in terms of grants, I'm going to mostly focus on postdoc positions for this video. Of course, there's other grants that are available for principal investigators like your R grants or P grants through the NIH. There's obviously grad school grants as well. So for example, if you're a grad student in the United States, you could apply for an F31. But what I want to do is talk about the grants that you could really be getting, you know, during your postdoc. And again, this is going to mainly be for, um, or solely going to be for those that are doing postdocs within the United States. Now, this is important because obviously if you're in Europe, there's other kinds of grants that are out there. I'm not quite as well versed in what all of them are and what all the requirements are. So I'm not going to really touch on those today. Um, but this is going to help those of you that are doing postdocs in the US. So there's really three different kinds of grants that you could get. The first is a training grant. The second is a fellowship. And the third is a career development grant. Now, training grants are really designed for new postdocs. So I had a training grant that I received as soon as I went in. So when I was wrapping up my grad school, I applied for a training grant and then got one and was able to use that training grant for the first you know, couple of years of my postdoc. And it was a T32, which is basically a, a training grant through the NIH. Now, the way that these training grants work is that um, the uh, actual institute that you're at will apply for them. So there was a PI on this grant who was a professor where I was, and there was a whole T32 program, and they had an allotment of grants that they were able to, to di diversify out to different postdocs. And the way that it worked was you would give your CV, you would give a cover letter, a research plan, and it would go to an internal review within the institute and they would decide which postdocs were gonna be able to get you know, those training grants for a couple of years. And you could have them for two years. Um, and so I was able to get one of those very fortunate, fortunately. Um, and you know, it, it does its thing. So the, the training grants are pretty nice. The biggest stipulation is that you had to be a, either a US citizen or a green card holder and that was kind of one of those things that's a little bit tricky inside of some of these NIH grants. Um, but if you are a green card holder or a US citizen, it was nice. It paid for my salary, so my PI didn't need to pay my salary. It was able to give me some money for training, so I used it to take some extra coursework. I used it to buy a computer. I used it to buy some software. It gives you money for travel and registration for conferences. So that was really nice. You know, you could go to a conference and your PI doesn't have to worry about paying for you. Um, and then it gives a small amount of money that you could use for, for lab equipment. So for example, I had used some of my training grant to buy a dissection microscope that I needed for a project. So we bought a dissection microscope with it. Um, after you've been in the lab for a couple of years, that's kind of when you're eligible for a fellowship. And the reason that it takes a couple of years is that for the fellowships, you tend to need a good amount of data for your proposal. So for a training grant, you don't. You could kind of just say, you know, there's this preliminary data that was generated by the lab, you know, very small amount. And because of that, this is sort of the project that I want to be taking on. It doesn't quite work that way with a fellowship. So with a fellowship, you actually need a significant amount of data, a couple years worth of data built up to be able to put together a very strong research proposal with multiple aims, not just a one aim kind of a grant. And so these are longer, usually a research strategy of about, you know, six page, uh, six pages, single space, you know, all the way crammed in and 10 point font or whatever the smallest is that they allow. Um, and, you know, it, that's why you need to be there for a couple of years before you could really be applying for these. And there's a few different ways that you could do them. So you could apply through the NIH for what's an, known as an F32. Now an F32, 
um, is, again, something that's only for green card holders or U.S. citizens. And there's also something called an F-33, which is kind of a brother application to this, but for a little bit more senior. So this is for somebody that's been there for, you know, four or five years in their postdoc, and they're not quite at the stage of being able to get a career development grant so they can apply for an F-33. But the F-32 is more in that range of someone that's been a postdoc for a couple of years. Now, there's other institutes that you could go to. So for example, if you do research in oncology, you could go through the National Cancer Institute. I'm sure that there's you know a variety of different um, sister programs that you could apply for fellowships. Where I was in diabetes, we would go through the American Diabetes Association, um, the ADA. That was one place you could go. I know that there's other ones like the American Heart Association. I actually got a fellowship through the American Heart Association um, to look at lipid signaling and how that can impact cardiometabolic health. So that's where my fellowship came from. And again, these fellowships are very similar to the training grants. They're going to pay for your salary. They're going to pay for some equipment, for some lab, um, lab equipment. You know, you can buy computers with them. They'll pay for conferences. They kind of have the same purpose, but they obviously have a little bit more prestige than a training grant. And the reason for that is that unlike a training grant, which is distributed throughout your institute, these are ones that you actually have to go out on your own and earn. Um, and when they score these, they score them on a variety of things. So I want to say when I did my American Heart Association Fellowship, and I had also applied for a, an NIH one as well, they looked at your proposal, they looked at your personal statement, your career goals, they looked at the institute, they looked at the training plan that you put together. So you can't just say, well, I'm going to do this research. You have to talk about what's your training plan going to be. Are you going to be taking courses? Are you going to be attending conferences? You know, how are you building yourself to the next step? Um, you know, they look at all of this when they come and they decide what it is that they want to fund or not fund. And, you know, of course, the most important part is that research proposal. Now, once you start getting more senior, you know, into your fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh year, this is when you could go for career development awards. And again, you could do this through the NIH or through other places like the American Diabetes Association. So I'll talk about the NIH because these seems to be the most popular places to do career development, but you can do them through other places. I've seen people that have gotten them, for example, through the American Diabetes Association and then use them to jumpstart their own lab. But in the NIH, there's really two different career development paths you could take, and that's the K01 and the K99. So the K01 tends to be a little bit less competitive. And the reason for that is there's no R component to it, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the K99. There's no R component to it. You have more time to generate data, meaning that there isn't a hard cap on like, you could only be in the lab for X amount of years doing a postdoc, and then after that, you're no longer eligible. They don't have that same kind of a cap on the K01. And it's really only for green card holders and U.S. citizens. So it eliminates, you know, anyone that's in the country working on a visa, which is a lot of scientists, quite frankly. Um, now, the K99 is a little bit different. The K99 is a K99 slash R00. And so what that means is it has an R component to it. And what that means is that after a couple years of the K99, you could apply for the R00 component. What that does is it gives you a lot more funding for the lab, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars for the lab. It's a, it's a lot of money that you could bring in for the lab. You know, that it's going to be your lab. It's not for your PI's lab. It's for your own lab. Um, and so that's why it's a little bit more attractive. The only thing is that this is open to everybody. So you could be on an H-1B, for example, and you could get one. Um, and there's a, a harder limit. So I want to say it's either four or five years. After five years, once you've been there for five plus years, you're no longer allowed to apply. So you have to apply earlier in your postdoc. So this is really for those folks that have really gotten some solid, particular, particularly solid data within their first few years and have published one or two or maybe even three papers You know, very early within their postdoc. Um, if you've published nothing and you have just average data, you're not really going to be in contention for that K99. Now, 
for the K component, whether it's K99 or, or, or K01, it's going to be the same. Um, what they're looking for is obviously the proposal. So they're looking for somebody that has a solid research proposal. They're looking for someone that they think has demonstrated proficiency to the point that they're at the point in their career that they're going to be able to leave the lab that they're in and start their own independent career. And independent is the key word. You need to make it very clear that what you're doing is not in direct competition with your current PI. And we've talked about this in other videos. You don't want to compete against your PI and the NIH doesn't want you to compete against your PI. Your PI is the expert in that area. You're never going to outcompete them. They don't want to see that. They want to see that you're going to be taking something that your PI is not going to be working on and that you're going to be able to start your own lab with that. Um, they want to look at the committee that you put together. So you're going to need a committee that's going to help guide you through the early parts of setting up your lab. Um, and they want to see somebody that they honestly think is going to be successful. Um, and this is your ticket, right? So. Yeah, having a cell nature science paper, those are nice. But in the US, if you want to get a faculty position, your golden ticket, you know, your way in is you need one of those career development grants. You need some sort of funding. If you don't have that, it's going to be really hard. Um, maybe if you want to go to a smaller school that's not focused on research, yeah, you know, you could publish a couple nice things and, you know, go over there and teach. But if you want to be doing research, you need to be bringing in your own money. I know that the universities give startup money, but it's it's not enough. They want you bringing in money and they want you doing it quickly. Um, so if you really want the edge and, you know, academia is really what you think your calling is, you need to be trying to get grants and not just one. You know, the best um, postdocs and the ones that I've seen that have gotten um, the most competitive jobs have had multiple grants. They got a training grant, a fellowship, and a career development, right? So I had done a training grant, a fellowship, and then I would have tried to get a training, uh, a career development grant if I stayed and wanted to become a PI. Obviously, I made the decision to move into industry, but you know, if I would have, that would have been my path. And then you have your papers on top of it. And then those are the people that ultimately are gonna be able to succeed and find that you know, PI position. So I've kind of let this video go on long enough, and I hope that I kind of addressed a few questions and talked about some of the slight differences. I know there's a lot more that I could talk about, and we could honestly spend an entire video plus talking about each one of these grants, if this is something that you guys are interested in. So as always, if this is something that you liked, please give it a thumbs up down below, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye.